Welcome. I'm Sarah Pritchard. I'm the Dean of Libraries. And we're especially excited this evening to partner with the Northwestern University Black Alumni Association on tonight's event, marking Black History Month by hearing from a leader in higher education and someone I personally admire, Dr. Janetta Cole. I'd like to recognize and thank Jeffrey Sterling, president of NUBA here, and Sonia Waiters, vice president of NUBA, uh, for proposing and collaborating with us to bring about this program. The libraries have been working with NUBA for over two years now toward the goal of building an archive that documents the influential history of NUBA and more broadly, the history of the black experience here at Northwestern. I'd like to introduce Charlotte Wilson, right over there. Charlotte joined the libraries and the archives last July as the archivist for the black experience at Northwestern. And her role here on campus is to grow the collection of documents that, that documents the history and experiences of black students, faculty, organizations, and communities at Northwestern. One of her very first assignments upon arrival was to begin work on an exhibit about the 1968 Bursar's Office takeover with less than a year prep time. Uh, the physical exhibit will open May 1st, and I'm pleased to say the online exhibit has just launched today. There was also a very nice uh, short documentary video about the online exhibit that was at the Northwestern News site recently. A link to this is on our library homepage. Now I would like to introduce at Jeffrey Sterling who will lead off the rest of the program. Jeff graduated from Northwestern in 1985 with a degree in psychology. He went on to receive a master's in health policy management from Harvard University School of Public Health and doctorate at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. He completed emergency medicine residency at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. He's a national leader in community-based medicine, healthcare, and public health. He serves as president and CEO of Sterling Initiatives, a healthcare consulting and implementation firm, assisting entities incorporate best practices. Jeff Sterling has served as the president of the NUBA board since 2014, and in this role, he introduced the NUBA Achievement Scholarship, the NUBA Archives Proposals, NUBA Economy Project, NUBA Summit, and Salute to Excellence Gala, one of which will be coming up this May. And, or is it April, I apologize. May. May, yes. And NUBA.org. Jeff is also, founding, also the founding chairperson of the Alpha Phi Alpha Endowment Fund at Northwestern. Please welcome Jeff Sterling. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. evening. I just want to echo and thank Sarah's um, words, what we have been able to do in collaboration with the university in general and with the library specifically is just, it's really a dream come true. And we just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to participate in the pres preservation, I mean, think about that, the preservation of a heritage. That's a really big deal, and believe it or not, it's something that appears to be unprecedented at major universities across the country. So again, please join me in thanking Northwestern and the library and Sarah and her team for helping us. <laughs> the amazement continues. I actually am going to have the pleasure of introducing um, subsequently two individuals that are just really require very little introduction, but I'm obligated to do so. First, um, we'll present Jonathan Holloway, who's the provost of Northwestern and has been so since August of 2017. Um, the provost is the chief academic officer of the university. And to have a conversation with this gentleman is to understand that in so many ways, there could not have been a much better choice for this university at this point in time or virtually at any point in time. Um, Jonathan immediately came to us from a place called Yale College where he was dean. And um, my God, he has been all over the place with so many fantastic 
things that he's done before then, but what is even more impressive is to understand what's yet to come in his role as the Chief Academic Officer of Northwestern. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Holloway. Thank you. I was going to say. I'm being told that we're going to, in the interest of moving this, uh, without me having to come back up, we're going to have both of our guests come up together. And Good. it is indeed a pleasure to bring Jeanette Cole up to the front. Now, this is, this is a pretty interesting thing, so bear with me for a second. I'm just going to start by pointing out that she has been the recipient of 68 honorary degrees. <laughs> I had, I, I'm is that sure all? most of us in the room would agree that's that we all. had trouble getting the ones that we get, but that's pretty phenomenal. Um, a couple of other things. You, you know she's affiliated with so many different universities, but she's a double wildcat. <laughs> all right, so this in many ways is, is the most important of all of that other stuff. Even though <laughs> she is noted to be the only individual, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I know I'm not, um, the only person who, I see you over there, the only person who has been the president of both of the um, historically black colleges and universities for women in the United States. And that's, of course, um, Spelman and Bennett College. Um, for the, she spent eight years as the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. How cool is that? I, I, I could literally go over all the things that she's done and it would take all night. It would actually be the program, but without further ado, allow me to yield the stage to these two wonderful individuals, Jonathan Holloway and Janetta Cole. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and, and good evening to you, Dr. Cole. No one's called you Sister Prez yet, so I'm going to be the first to say that. You know, it's, it's a pleasure. It's actually an honor to be here. Um, so I have been, I was going to say task, but that's really not the right word. I've been given the gift of sitting up here in front of you and, and asking you all kinds of questions. And for those who don't know um, a little bit about my background, so you'll understand why I'm asking questions in a certain kind of way. Uh, I specialize in post-emancipation African-American history, and in my um, most recent monograph, Jim Crow Wisdom, I talk, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about what memory is versus what history is. So we're going to talk a bit mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also spend time talking about um, museums, the archive, and the African-American experience, things that I may have written some things about it, but you are truly the expert in that regard, and so I hope that we can travel down that road a little bit together. So when I think, to, as a way of setting things up, when I think of the African American experience broadly writ, it's an experience that is rich in all the different ways that we can imagine, but it is also an experience that, um, for much of its history, has been archived in a particular kind of way. It's either been archived in the family story that's mm -hmm. passed down, or it is in an oral tradition, or it's archived in the margins of the Bible, the family Bible, that gets stored somewhere, or, or it's archived in, well, in, along these lines. Um, it is too rarely archived in places that we officially recognize as archives. So when we think about this incredibly rich history, and we know that it's a rich history, it is um, post-Middle Passage, it is the American story as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. What does it mean that that archive is not in an official place? So we're gonna, we're gonna start from that, that particular perspective. Now, I mentioned that the African-American archive is often an oral archive, it's, an, it's a family archive, and it's, it's the archive we carry around us in our DNA and in our memories. So I wonder if you can start um, with a reflection. You've done all these amazing things in your career and leadership of important organizations and, and hold um, a position of recognition at, with at least 68 universities, as we found out. <laughs> what has been your family inspiration? I mean, what, what's, mm -hmm. what is part of your archive mm -hmm. that motivated you that told you to go in this direction, mm -hmm. that sent you down this road? Mm -hmm. Well, first I want to formally greet you, brother, Provost. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I am not just saying words. I, I'm really very, very honored. I feel very privileged to sit and have a conversation with the Brother Provost of my university. Thank you. You know, I'm very fond of Proverbs, and I'm sure over the cor course of the evening you're going to hear more than one. But I do want to respond to something you just said with a proverb. It is an African saying, until the lions, and I'm going to add in the lionesses, tell their own story, the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Yes. You know that. I know it. We all know it. And so I have to begin by saying I am intensely proud of my university for taking this step to assemble the history and the her story of the black presence on this particular campus. Now, because I've been so, so honored to be a first, I have another saying I want to put out. And this is not an African proverb. I'm saying this. It's one thing to be a first. What's important is to have a second, a fifth, a 96, a 1,000. Yes. Every university needs to collect, value, share the experiences of all in its community. So in terms of my own life, her story, I'm very, very fortunate. Even before the days of an emphasis on genealogy, we have known so much about the maternal side of my family. Mm -hmm documented in dissertations, in books, in articles. And so even as a, as a little girl, I mean, knee-high to a duck, I had a sense of who my people were. I knew that my great-grandfather, whose name was Abraham Lincoln, Lewis. <laughs> Like many African-American men of that era, he, bear, he bore that name in acknowledgment of the role he understood Abraham Lincoln had played. And I knew Abraham Lincoln Lewis. I knew this man who, with six other African-American men, had founded an insurance company called the Afro-American Life Insurance Company. I knew that he founded a beach because during that era, black folk couldn't go on white folks' beaches. And Abraham Lincoln said, black people need recreation without humiliation. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that Abraham Lincoln Lewis had married the great granddaughter of a slave master, Zephaniah Kingsley, and his common-law wife, Anta Njijinai Majai Kingsley. Actually, Anta Majijinai Njai Kingsley was a 15-year-old girl sent through that, mm, that door of no return on Gory Island mm -hmm. in Senegal. So, unlike many others, I grew up with that history and her story. I grew up with a consciousness about the continent. My great-grandfather had been assigned the, 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 the task of naming the insurance company, and he chose Afro-American. But Brother Provost, I also grew up with another narrative that said I had no history, mm -hmm. that said somehow, unlike all of the other people of the earth, black folk just, you know, we just sort of appeared. 
But do you know what? I came to a place called Northwestern. And I came to a place where a scholar, Melville J. Herskovitz, had written a book in 1941, The Myth of the Negro Past, that said I did have a history. Mm -hmm that said, I did not stand on the shores of Africa pulling out of me mores and values and culture. And so I'm sharing with you how fortunate I have been to grow up in a family with a knowledge and a love of its own history and her story, and to end up at a place called Northwestern where I could then intellectually understand the importance of lions and lionesses telling their own story of the hunt. My goodness, what an answer. <laughs> <clears throat> so when you're in my position at a university, you, you go to give introductions and talks and and you're running around, you know this, you're running around left and right and you're heading out the door, where am I going? And someone right. hands you a piece of paper and these are your talking points. And I was given talking points for um, this to you know, ask particular questions and I'm just ignore the rest of them at this point. Yeah, so, let's just, let's <laughs> just. this got a lot more interesting all yeah. of a sudden. No, there are, there are, I mean, everything you said resonates at a deep level for me as an individual walking around in this particular skin in this particular country with me for having a matrilineal history that's well known in my family, patrilineal not as well, but better than most. Mm -hmm. And coming from a family, in my case, a family background of educators. The odd thing is, when you think about, and this, this, and we are, this will be not about me, but this is sort of a setup, I'll say. Um, so much of my own childhood, no, of my adulthood, I'm sorry, really is my coming to consciousness about this issue, this, this um, black folks don't have a history. Because I always knew that I had, I mean, mm -hmm. I always knew what my history was. And as I became aware of this larger phenomenon, I couldn't make sense of what I had known in terms of the family history, and then what I was becoming, eventually heading on the road to being a professor. And it is really quite shocking for me, and it really started when I was in graduate school, and then certainly going through the ranks and becoming an administrator, how many times I've had to encounter the surprise that someone like you or me not just could string together a sentence in the King's English. And be so articulate. And it's, you know, and clean, <laughs> right? And so the... Um, but, the, but precisely that, and there mm -hmm. is, just as there is a tyranny of low expectations, um, there is also a, an astonishing level of disbelief that there could be generations of history, right? That there are histories, as you mentioned with Melville Herskovitz, the cutting edge cultural anthropologist who essentially created the field here, who was able to put together a narrative that this mm -hmm. history goes back not just hundreds of years, but crosses thousands of miles. And for those who don't know, this is actually my first visit to Northwestern was to go to the Melville Herskovitz collection. This is the place in the United States to study African history. In the world, and, actually. And, and the collection in the Herskovitz mm -hmm. archive, which is, I think, literally that direction, um, thinking in three dimensions, um, is, it is the destination uh, for it's where you can come to start the investigations of this African uh, past, diasporic past in, in, within in continental mm -hmm. African past. It's an amazing collection. Herskowitz himself was fascinating though. So here's a person who broke convention, essentially saying these so-called primitive people had a history, just even had a history, and that they retained these traditions as they were forced to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and that they, these traditions survived the horrors of slavery. This was pathbreaking, and actually became the foundation for black studies. Absolutely. Um, as an intellectual foundation, and mm -hmm. some people don't feel comfortable with that fact, but that is the fact. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. a scholarly basis 
for what becomes black studies in the 60s. So I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit more about your own work within the world of anthropology, which is a, which is a very complicated space as far as what is authentic, who has a culture, mm -hmm. who has value, who, from whom can we learn certain things, and then help us transition from that experience, your experiences here, or your knowledge of the field, towards you know, the Black Studies Revolution, and which in, manifested here in the Bursos office takeover, that you know, take us from that journey, if you will, mm -hmm. gets us into mm -hmm. the late 60s. Well, if I could, I'd like to start with my folks, my mom and my dad. They were very pushy, I mean really pushy black Southern folk. So pushy were they. And so much did they believe in education. I like to say, like the devil believes in sin, <laughs> that I was sent off at age 15 to go take a test. And my parents said, if I passed the test, then I would go to Fisk University at age 15. I didn't want to go to any university. <laughs> I wanted to have my senior year with my friends. But so dumb was I that I went downtown, took the test, and passed. You All I well, had to do <laughs> was fail the test, right? And I could have stayed. All right. So my, my, intellectual journey didn't begin there. It obviously began in the first grade with Ms. Vance and my first grade teacher. But off I went to Fisk, convinced that I would be a baby doctor. That tells you about my feminism at the time. Not a neuro, you know, scientist, not a um, astrophysicist. I was going to be a baby doctor. I didn't stay at Fisk but for one year because that was the year that my dad died and I was my daddy's baby mm. girl. So I went off to Oberlin on an exchange program largely because my sister was there. She was a double major in voice and piano and I needed comforting. So one day I'm in the residence hall at Oberlin we called them dorms then. And I said to all my friends, shh, be quiet, be quiet, I need help. I need a course that meets after 10 a.m. The prof can't be a bore. And I wanted to help satisfy my social science requirement. One of my friends said, look at this, take this, take this course. Brother Provost, I had to sound out one of the words, I could read introduction to cultural, I had to sound out anthropology. <laughs> so I walked into the class. This is Oberlin College now. The prof walks in, tall, lanky, white prof. He doesn't go to the board, he doesn't write his name, he doesn't say good morning students. He takes a record player this tells you how old I am, puts the head on a record and this pulsating music begins. And rather than saying anything, he starts moving around the class going, <gasps> <gasps> he's simulating hyperventilating. And we're saying, now we know Oberlin is pretty out there, <laughs> but this is beyond reasonable. <laughs> then he takes the needle off of the record, and then he says, good morning, class. I'm Professor George Eaton Simpson. This is Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. And what I have just done is to simulate what happens in a Jamaican revivalist cult when individuals are calling forth the spirits into their own beings so that they become possessed. I said, oh, oh, this is like what happens in Mount Olive Bay and Mead Church when people get happy. And I said, goodbye, 
pediatrics, <laughs> hello, anthropology. <laughs> Back in those days, and to some extent, I hope it is still true, students were very influenced by a major professor. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with anthropology, so of course when it was time for graduate school, I went where Professor Simpson told me to go. He was a student of Melville J. Herskovitz's. Mm. So there was no question. And by that time, I was so in love with anthropology. I graduated from Oberlin in May. By June, I was here. <laughs> I was very fortunate to be African-American and female because Melville J. Herskovitz really did believe that black people could be intelligent, mm -hmm. that women could be scholars. And so my only disadvantage was that Professor Herskovitz was, I don't know, maybe five feet three or four, <laughs> and I'm five, seven and a half. So at least I knew whenever I walked into his office, the first thing to do was to find a chair, all right? <laughs> I became his student, and my master's thesis done at this university is probably not the best thesis, but it's terribly Herskovitzian. Mm -hmm. I then began to study with Paul J. Bohannon, Mm -hmm. a great social anthropologist, again at Northwestern. I knew Gwendolyn Carter. I knew Francis Hsu. I mean, I studied with the great anthropologist, American anthropologist at this university. Well, while my sisters and brothers were taking over the bursar's office, which is exactly what they were supposed to do, and doing it nonviolently. Mm -hmm. I was in my first teaching job, having done my field work in Liberia. I was in my first teaching job at Washington State University. So rather than taking over the bursar's office, we had our own version of that at about the same period of time. I was a professor. I was going to march with my students. I was protesting why that university's curriculum was situated in the three W's, Western, white, and womanless. And the day came when I and my students went to jail because we were arrested for protesting hmm. for what we knew was right. That a university must be a place that has the voices, the emotions, the history, the culture, the experiences of all. And there weren't enough black folk at WSU. So from that experience, I had this strong sense that I know you share. And that is that a college or university is not just a place where you come to understand the world better. It's a place where you accept your responsibility to help to make the world better. And during the 1960s, I and countless others thought the way to make the world better was to protest against a war that we thought was inhumane. It was to nonviolently walk and sit and pray and sing for the rights of black people. So my early days in anthropology in a sense, kind of naturally moved into African-American studies. Now, and I will bring closure on this very shortly. Once I was in African-American studies, I couldn't help but ask a question. Hmm, 
This is black studies. This is Washington State University. I'm proud to say I helped to found one of the first black studies programs in our country. But as I pursued that interdisciplinary field, I kept looking for the women folk. Black studies in its early days was highly patriarchal. Mm -hmm. So I found my way into women's studies and did so especially at UMass Amherst, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and very definitively at Hunter College, where not only a collegial relationship, but a deep friendship, a sisterly friendship with Audre Lorde mm. taught me more about what I needed to know than anyone else had ever done. Because it's she who taught me my, about my multiple identities. So now I'm in women's studies, and I'm saying, where are the people of color? <laughs> So my, my journey, my intellectual journey, seems to be filled with what's missing. A search for a more complete understanding of the human experiences, but always, of course, through a particular set of lenses. Mm -hmm. So I hope mm -hmm. that is in some way a response to oh, I think my it journey. Is. Yeah, I think it is. So you've, you, you, you've talked about your education starting from the very earliest days and moving across time through the family, of course, and then having moments of inspiration in, in the classroom, whether it's at a little bit at Fisk, mostly at Oberlin, and then Northwestern, which is wonderful. Um, but then the education continues in terms of going from receiving it to delivering it mm -hmm. and then even creating it. I mean, one of the things people don't think about in the formation of black studies is you talk to those early pioneers in the classroom, there wasn't a literature that they had. A, they had to pull things together, work Absolutely. the mimeograph machine and, and create not just the syllabus, but the texts that the syllabus can refer to. I mean, it is making things from scratch, mm -hmm. even though the history has been there. And it's certainly you're exactly right in terms of its um, patriarchal structure. And then, and then also in women's studies, like where are the black women? This is a complete mirror of what's happening in the larger like, feminist movement and things mm -hmm. like that. But, or maybe, maybe but's not the right word, fast forwarding, you end up in that space as the president of Spelman. And then, the, and then after a, a break, um, mm -hmm. president of Bennett, my paternal grandmother's a Bennett Bell, my grand, mm -hmm. we didn't have this conversation, my grandfather taught there actually as well, my maternal grandfather. My family's from Greensboro, so we're getting really local here. Uh, so <laughs> and my aunt went to Oberlin, she knows you, we forgot to talk about that earlier, but anyway. Um, it's a small world. It so. is. <laughs> it is teenage. It's itsy bitsy. <laughs> but so you had um, the most important roles at Spelman and then later on at Bennett, where you were focusing. I mean, the, the mission of these universities is to educate the next generation of African American women leaders. That's the historical mission. Right. Right. So, was this just an inevitability? Is this just I'm finally living my mission? What tell us about those? You know, what are a few highlights you can share with us? Mm. You know, based on your own journey, your own educational set of experiences, your expertise, mm -hmm. what do you take with you about your Spelman and Bennett experiences? Well, I must begin by saying a word of gratitude to the two women who to this very day are major mentors for me. Because without them, I never would have ended up at Spelman College. One is Marion Wright Edelman, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the president of the Children's Defense Fund. And the other is Donna Shalala, mm -hmm. former president of the University of Wisconsin, more recently Miami, and of course, Health and Human um, Services Secretary. I was a happy professor. I mean, I love being a professor. My greatest 
my most important, not greatest, my most important self-identity in addition to being a mom and a grandma, and not a bad wife, is that I am really a teacher. Mm -hmm. At heart, that's who I am. I'm a teacher. So here I am at Hunter College, and I'm just having myself the best time. I'm teaching anthropology, but I'm also um, heading uh, Caribbean and Latin American studies at CUNY at the Graduate Center. I am doing women's studies. I'm you know, learning more and more from my colleagues, and Audre Lorde is just teaching me about intersectionality and multiple identities, and I am happy. Well, I went to Brazil um, with another professor. We had arranged to do a, a, uh, a program in Sao Paulo, and I come back from Brazil, and on my desk it says, see the president immediately, and I thought, it sounds like, you know, I'm being called to the principal's You're office. You're in trouble. That's what right. is Donna's problem? <laughs> and I go to see her, and she says, Marion and I have decided <laughs> you're going to apply for the presidency of Spelman. I said, Donna, I'm the happy prof. I got convinced, and I applied. It was an unbelievably extraordinary experience. And I think it's important for me to say that not only was I the first African-American woman to serve as the president of an African-American women's college in 107 years, but that in being so, Spelman became every black woman's college. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter where she went to school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She owned Spelman. And in concentric circles, Spelman became the school for Latinas and the school for Asian American women and the school for First Nation or American Indian women and the school for white women. It became every woman's school. For me, it was a priceless experience to be in a leadership role in a place where the students were a reflection of myself. I always thought, you know, I didn't go to Spelman, but if there is ever such a thing as reincarnation, when I come back, I'm going to be a fresh woman at Spelman College. My greatest fear in those 10 years was that one day I would come back to campus from fundraising. I often tease with Brother President Morty that a college or university president is somebody who lives in a big house and begs for a living. <laughs> so I would be coming back to Spelman College, fundraising somewhere, and I'd look up on the top of Rockefeller Hall, the administration building, and on the top of that building, I feared there would be countless Spelman women, and they would be going like this, because they believed what we told them, that they could fly. <laughs> now I know here is Rose Harris Johnson, class of 57 of Spelman College. Am I speaking the truth? <laughs> so to me what was so crucial about that experience was seeing what I had not always seen at predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. And that is a belief in black students. James Baldwin once said, you cannot teach a child that you do not love. And if there's one thing that I think 
characterizes our HBCUs, our historically black colleges and universities. And we do have our challenges. How well you know, you mm -hmm. just finished narrating a good deal of a film about HBCUs. But professors believe in their students. They believe they can do anything. Mm -hmm. And then they provide a kind of safety net if those students dare to fall. The Bennett experience, I'm so glad to know there's a Bennett Bell <laughs> in your family, her story. Yes, ma'am. Bennett, no less the belief in women. The belief that women can do science. What do you mean women can't do science? What do you mean, what do you mean women can't do math? Of course they can. But from the Spellman experience, Brother Provost, I would lift up something from the Spellman experience as well, from Northwestern and what we are commemorating this year from what you narrate in Tell Them We Are Rising, the history of historically black colleges and universities. From Bennett, I lift up the role of student activism. Now, I know that everybody tells the story of four a and <laughs> students who went yes. downtown in Greensboro and sat at that Woolworth lunch counter. But let the history include her story. Spellman women, no, but Bennett women were a part of the very organizing. Mm -hmm. And Bennett women, 250, went to jail, sitting in for the right of black folk to have the respect to have lunch. Now, let me tell you, there was not only student activism. There was a leader there whose name was Willoughby Player. First black woman president of a four-year institution. Willoughby Player, in the morning, would collect the homework from the professors at Bennett, take it to jail, for her students, go back at night, pick up the homework, and distribute it to the professors. Mm. That's how much student activism was chiseled into Bennett history and her story. And then finally, I would lift up Representative Alma Adams, who now represents uh, a part of North Carolina in Congress. She taught art for many, many years at Bennett, but she is known and beloved for a call and then a response. So if I go among a group of Bennett women right now and I say, Bennett bells, the response is, are voting bells. Nice. Student activism was so much a part of the 60s, and not just at predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would be fair in saying, you're the historian, that few, if any, black colleges and universities went through the 60s without activism, oh, without yes. protests. Yes. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm so proud of my alma mater for commemorating, for remembering that nonviolent takeover of the bursar's office because we still got some work to do here at Northwestern, Brother Provost. Yeah, yes, I heard you. <laughs> I could be here for hours and hours, but do you have time for one more question? Sure. Um, okay. If we haven't so, worn everybody out yet. <laughs> all right, hang in with us then. So we've, we've talked about your, your childhood, your, your course of study growing up, and, and now your presidencies and these, this inspiration and connection to students. 
And you're absolutely right that um, we in administrations, administrators, run the risk of um, not, we, we invite difficulties if we choose not to listen to our students. And that's a, what a lot of the activism was about. It's like, this is the only way we can get your attention. Oh, that's um, so true. But, and so we, we've got to, your work has not just, though, been at um, universities, and an incredibly important role at the Smithsonian. And we've talked about your family history, the archive of your memory, your imagination. Mm -hmm. We've talked about your scholarly development, um, your, uh, your immersion into archives. Um, you've taken us through our own set of part of the American archive of the celebrated 1960s and what that, what that has meant for you as well. Universities, museums are themselves archives, whether it's the literal archive where papers are stored mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. videotapes, whatever it might be. But they are sort of living organisms and archives. And I wonder if you can wrap up this conversation thinking about the role of and I forgot to mention libraries, of course, and archives. What is the role of the archive in a fully complicated and rich way of thinking of what that word means? Mm -hmm. What is the role of the archive in understanding who we are as a people, who our students are as individual actors, and what all of this means for how we understand mm -hmm. how we even got to this mm -hmm. place in the first place? Yeah. Well, I want to say something, if I may, about libraries before I say something about archives. Oh. And I must because my memory forces me to do so. When I grew up in the deeply horrific days of racial segregation, legal racism, in Jacksonville, Florida. The library was my refuge. Hmm. I want to tell you the name of that library. When I walked up after school to spend time with my mother's closest friend, Olga Bradham, the librarian, I walked up the steps and I saw the name of the library. A, L for Abraham Lincoln, Lewis, mm. colored public library. How a library could be both colored and public. Uh, so in many ways, the library, or as my people would say, the library. <laughs> The library represented that dual narrative for me, you know. That white folks said it had to be the colored library and the books would come from the main library, just as the books that I studied from came from white schools. That's why they were used and underlined and with pictures. So that was that narrative. But inside of that library was Olga Bradham, whose passion for learning was contagious, mm. who taught me that libraries could take me places without my ever leaving my little chair. So I've always had this passion. And I also want to say that when I was a graduate student, trying to make a little bit of money, because that Ford Foundation scholarship, <laughs> fellowship I had wasn't cutting it, I worked in this library. Mm. I worked in Deary. So there is a place in my heart for libraries that is deep and ongoing. Of all the things that a library does, sh 
surely we've got to gain or we've got to develop greater respect for its archives. Because that is in some ways the most sacred of all places. It is the place that dares to gather and hopefully to almost rock as if they are newborns, the very meaning of humanity. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I just felt so privileged to be invited to have this conversation with you that really lifts up, that says in this library, there will be a place where the stories of women and men will be told, black women, black men, their stories told going back as far as possible. It's a beautiful thing. And I think that is how you end an interview. Thank you very much. <laughs>
certain individuals have been mentioned. And you know, symbolically, the individuals sitting in these chairs here are just fantastic um, on so many different levels. But thank you, Johnetta, for helping us to understand that looking at history could be cool. And, and symbolically mm -hmm. and practically, that very much is the case. And thank you so much to the provost office for actually providing the financial support um, for this effort again. Thank you to Jabbar Bennett for being part of the team that actually conceived and approved um, this on the university side. And certainly Kevin Leonard, the university archivist, has been a true partner with us every step of the way, and we are just greatly appreciative. Um, again, let's think this through. What we're trying to do is to really capture the history in a way that is illuminating and allows us to reveal the excellence that this university represents and that we have achieved inside of this university. So we do leave here with a call for everyone to um, look under their beds and up in the attics and we'll work with you. We have been doing that and as a matter of fact, you know, Lauren Lowry, who is actually the conceptual uh, founder of this entire notion, um, has been gathering along with me for years now um, what now amounts to thousands of documents um, in preparation of the agreement with the university. So this one particular gift that we have to give you guys is it's quite special. Lauren, come help me unveil this. This is pretty cool. Um, this gift actually comes from. <laughs> well, this is pretty cool. This gift comes from the Katrina Adams collection. Now everybody here should know Katrina Adams. She's a Northwestern University athlete Athletic Hall of Fame inductee in 1997. She actually is the current president, chairman, and CEO of the USTA, United mm. States Tennis Association, and in fact is the first African American and mm. is now serving her second term. Um, we have collected a ton of stuff, and what we are giving this evening is the very beginning of what will be offered in that regard. This actually comes from her mother. Um, this is her mother's how should we describe it, collection of her high school um, scrapbook. So as we unveil this, for those of you that are able to see it, there's some amazingly fantastic. I love upside down. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. The other thing, because there's one thing that's a, a great, a great part of this that just is screaming to be told. For those of you that are familiar with the Wimbledon Championships, and she famously uh, competed there, she actually caused quite the stir. Look at her bum! In this headline <laughs> called Wimble Bum. And the reason wasn't just because her skirt flew up, but because she broke the tradition of not wearing all white at Wimbledon. So she has a ton of information that we will be gathering mm. and over a period of time Better. transferring over to the archives. The other part of the collection that we're offering today is the beginning of what is now thousands of pictures that Nuba holds. And as we are organizing them, and we have an entire committee led by Lauren to actually identify, to do some of the work on the front end, to identify the members of the um, Nuba and University community that are featured in these pictures. We are going to be very pleased to share this with the um, university and continue to work with the university to define what collections should be chased and what stories should be told as a result of it. One final piece, um, Lauren and I are very pleased um, to actually be writing a book um, based on the work that we've done that's entitled Voices and Visions the evolution of the black experience at Northwestern University that will be released in May. And it actually goes back over the 150 year history through oral histories of approximately 60 individuals who have been prime movers and key individuals in the history of the university. So we're beginning the process and we'll continue to build on that in the years to come. So thank you to everyone here. You each have a role to play in the development of the archives. And thank you so much to our great university for allowing us to participate and to help direct um, the way in which our university is growing. So thank you. Mm.
and even a champagne toast. One thing more, one thing more, more announcement. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard the news, but I would be, again, remiss had I not acknowledged that um, Lerone Bennett actually passed. Mm -hmm. um, he is pivotal, Lerone Bennett, Jr. He was pivotal in the history and the development of African-American studies here at the university. Um, back in 68, he was a visiting professor and was actually slated to be the first um, chair of FM studies. He passed just yesterday. And again, we just want to do a hat tip yes. for that particular yes. contribution. And hi, Kathleen, who has been here every step of the way with us as well as everyone else. Let's give her a round of applause. So thank you very much.